Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we would like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity uh, to present you our paper about uh, modeling cultural change. Uh, in this talk, we would like to focus on two issues. First, uh, with the use of predictive modeling and particularly a fuzzy logic and the neural network, we would like to explain a uh, spatial distribution of the sites. And secondly, uh, using uh, spatio-temporal modeling, uh, we want to investigate uh, possible interactions among sites. So, to speak about uh, chronological and uh, geographical background, uh, uh, we are focusing on the period of Middle Neolithic, which was from 5300 to 4900 BC. And in this time period, uh, there were spread uh, four archaeological culture, cultures. Uh, from uh, the geographical uh, background, uh, our studied area uh, consists of uh, river Ipel Voli, uh, with all of its tributaries. Uh, from this area, uh, we collected by study of the literature and by field walking around uh, 500 components. Uh, to the predictive modeling, we used only those components which were uh, sufficiently dated and localized uh, in space. Uh, I will uh, present you uh, uh, model creation uh, by fuzzy logic and my colleague uh, will present you uh, neural networks. So uh, in both of our approaches uh, we used uh, these uh, seven environmental parameters. Uh, in each of the parameter uh, there is a unique uh, distribution of values. In the fuzzy logic, uh, which is uh, logic uh, uh, very suitable for archaeology because it explains very well uncertainty in the data. Uh, there is a necessity for uh, four uh, control points in order to transform the input data in a scale from zero to one. So in order to have some objective measure how to uh, take these control points, a series of uh, percentiles uh, was used. Uh, we uh, used a uh, Saga GIS software and this software offers you two tools. One tool is Fuzzify, which transforms your data into the scale from zero to one. And another tool is called Fuzzy Intersection, which combines the transformed layer uh, layers into the predictive model. Uh, there are uh, used three different variants of the final predictive model calculation and we uh, compared all of them. Uh, the explanation of the procedure uh, will be based on the sites of LBK and Gelezotze group. Here in this first chart uh, you can see uh, the values of uh, Gini coefficient. Uh, Gini coefficient is a measure of uh, distribution. Uh, values close to zero mean uh, perfect equality and values closer to one means perfect inequality. In order to better explain this chart, we calculated a number of components in uh, the zone with uh, high probability uh, and with the zone uh, with low probability. And as we can see, the Gini coefficient corresponds very well with the zone of low probability of sites. Uh, therefore, for uh, our purposes, we should uh, take a closer look uh, to the models based on the fifth percentile. But uh, we can compare two extreme cases, a uh, model based on fifth percentile and model based on 50th uh, percentile. Uh, in order to validate these two models, we used so-called internal validation, which is based on an assumption that a predictive model is validated if sites are uh, located, if the majority of the site is located uh, in a zone with higher potential and this zone should have uh, the least extent. So if we take a look at this line of, of the tables, we see that uh, the model based on fifth percentile is validated through internal testing. That means we used the same sites uh, as the model was calculated. Uh, so here is a visualization of, of the uh, predictive model. And this model was uh, 
tested externally. Uh, we took uh, a new set of test sites, uh, which were discovered very recently by uh, field walking within the ESAP project. Here uh, in this uh, table, we can see that the spatial attributes of these new test sites resemble uh, quite a lot uh, the original data set. So we assume that these uh, sites will fit very well within the existing predictive model. So uh, we extracted the cell values within the point, lo point locations and we see that most of the sites fall within the model based on the fifth percentile. So again, we see that this model is working and uh, it's also validated through external set of the sites. Uh, last step was creation of the final predictive model, which consists of uh, both uh, original set of sites and the test sites. And we see uh, through internal testing that this model works even better. It explains 76% uh, of the site and uh, the zone with highest potential has uh, approximately 35% uh, of, of the extent of the total, uh, total area. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the contemporary uh, cultures, which are uh, Eastern, LBK and Buk culture, uh, with the same methodology, with the same procedure, we were not uh, successful uh, because uh, almost uh, the majority, majority of the sites fall within the zone of low potential. So the models are not validated and we are thinking about uh, two reasons. Probably we were working with a low sample size. You can see we were working only with the nine uh, sites or uh, there could be some other uh, probably non-practical reasons which somehow affected the distribution of the sites in the landscape. Uh, now I would like to ask my colleague uh, Niklas uh, to talk about uh, neural networks. Um, we would like to present some preliminary results uh, of modeling using machine learning, um, mainly because of lack of access to sufficient hardware. This must be regarded as a work in progress. But we believe it might be of interest to you, and we'd love to get some feedback on it. The training area for the model is a nearly 2,000 square kilometers area in the central Ipoi River drainage basin. Uh, in the area are no, uh, 64 known uh, middle Neolithic sites, and for this we used GRASS GIS and R with the R, uh, FRBS fuzzy rule based system package. The modeling was made with HIFES, Hybrid Neural Fuzzy Inference System, a system based on neural networks. Uh, its fuzzy rules use the Mandani model and uses Gaussian uh, membership function. The training data of this, the area was of a 25 meter resolution and it was decreased by random sampling to about 15%. To this was added the sites with a 100 meter buffer. The training data consisted of seven variables, as we have used before, with one exception. Instead of local elevation, we used landform, which was created in the GRASS GIS module R point, point uh, geomorphon, which calculates terrain forms and associated uh, uh, geometry using machine vision approach. And is represented by an integer from one to 10, from flat area one through slope five to depression 10. The model created by machine learning was then tested on smaller areas in the middle Ipoi river area. One 240 square kilometer area was tested at 100 meter resolution and a smaller about five square kilometer area at 25 meter resolution. Now, unfortunately, um, we cannot give you information on, on statistical significance. However, we believe a visual evaluation uh, indicates quite plausible and promising results. Uh, this was the case for the 25 meter data as well as the 100 meter resolution data. Obviously, the 25 meter data produced a lot more varied and finer results. So we, we now feel comfortable to continue with this work, to test bigger areas, uh, do, to do statistical evaluation, 
uh, of the results and elaborate on the input variables. Uh, so let's move to the uh, second question, and it was how we can uh, model uh, the uh, relation between sides. Uh, to answer this question, we take a look at the spatio-temporal modeling, uh, which uh, consists of a uh, principle charted here in the upper part. So the relative chronological dating of archaeological sites is transformed to absolute chronological uh, time scale. To each site, uh, uh, there is a certain, some temporal uncertainty, and you can visualize your results very much. Uh, with this approach, uh, you can use all of your data, even uncertain data, and you can take a look at uh, the phenomenon uh, from spatial, temporal aspect, and you can compare uh, compare your results. Uh, one uh, of the uh, uh, cons we could think is that this uh, approach is highly dependent on the input parameters. So we can now speak particularly in our uh, data set. Here you can see our categories of dating and their uh, temporal uncertainty. And this uh, temporal uncertainty was then uh, transformed into absolute chronological time scale. Uh, you can see that the development, uh, the Neolithic development in the River Ipoy Valley was quite uh, stable. After the early Neolithic, we see high increase uh, of the sites, uh, uh, high increase of the components, and they, these components gradually decrease towards the end uh, of the Neolithic. So let's see a graphical visualization of this temporal uncertainty in the beginning of the Neolithic. You can see that in different parts of our studied area, settlement cores were created. Uh, in the next time block, uh, we see a high increase of the components and the settlement areas expanded. Uh, this is also a time period uh, of Gelezolce uh, group and big culture. And as we can see, there is no uh, cultural boundary. Uh, the sites were communicating uh, with each other. Uh, in the next uh, time block, uh, we see that the sites, uh, the, the number of components did not change. The uh, density of the components in the eastern part remained the same, but something happens in, in the western part. and. Uh, we see that in the next time block uh, there are created two large uh, group of the sites uh, and uh, in the eastern part we see some increase in the density which confirm itself in the next time block we see here a low density of the settlements and quite a lot of settlement clusters in western part of the study area so uh, to sum up uh, Predictive model for the LBK and Jelizotse group was uh, quite uh, successful. It explained almost 80% of the sites in the landscape. These sites were located in uh, uh, on fertile soils, soils in warm climate. So we think about the orientation towards agricultural way of life. Uh, the contemporary uh, Eastern LBK and big culture, uh, the predictive model was not very successful and uh, probably uh, sites were located in a colder climate, not so fertile soils, and we can think about probably uh, non-practical reasons. Uh, uh, with the use of spatio-temporal modeling, we can see that there is no uh, cultural boundary between distinct cultural groups, and this is more of an issue of uh, cultural historical uh, paradigm. In the future, we would like to uh, further test our predictive models and we would uh, like to focus on neural networks. Uh, last but not least, uh, we want to thank uh, Silvia Fabian, uh, Silvia Guba and the ISA project uh, for the possibility to work with unpublished data and we would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>